So to kick things off, um, my name is Yvonne Liao. I am the creator in residence at CUNY's New Mark J School. I'm also the founder of Bewilder, an outdoor recreation startup based in California. And I'm super excited for this creator talk. Uh, we're really lucky to have Andrea Hernandez. Um, she is the cult leader of Snack Shot, uh, a media <laughs> company that curates the consumer food and beverage space to kind of see what's coming next. There's really no better creator to be talking about brand because she literally curates CPG brands um, across the world. <laughs> so we're really excited to have her. She's worn multiple hats prior to this. Um, she's been a content manager, PR specialist, copywriter in advertising, e-commerce, and social media. Very um, prolific. And we're really <laughs> pumped to be able to hear a little bit more about how she began Snackshot and grew it to where it is today. So before we get started, I just want to share that we uh, do want to encourage everyone to share their own projects, put their, uh, make a little introduction in the chat room as we're talking. This is very much an opportunity and space for journalism creators to get to know one another, as well as for you to get to know Andrea. And in terms of the format today, we will have 45 minutes of just questions, Q&A between uh, Andrea and I, and then we will open that up to the audience. And then if you want to stick around, we'll actually do breakout sessions for another 10 to 15 minutes um, at, at the very end. Andrea will be saying goodbye. She has a hard stop, but it will just be another chance for people to get to know each other and just kind of chat about the topics that we're discussing today. So feel free to add any questions to the chat and I will do my best to also be peer into them and ask them. And with that, let's get started. So Andrea, first off, branding can have a bit of like a negative connotation. Um, sometimes people are thinking of like, oh, influencers, selling out, self-promotion. It's something that a lot of journalists, myself included, can sometimes feel really uncomfortable about doing. But how do you think about branding and why is it so important to you? <laughs> Well, first of all, I'm so excited to be on here and thank you so much for having me. And I will say I do come from a marketing uh, background. So I went, I actually went to school to study marketing and communications. Um, I, I, like you said, I worked really much like kind of in the behind the scenes of what goes into building a brand. I will say it all depends. I guess like I'm, I'm a self-proclaimed narcissist. So like for me, it kind of came easy, but I do understand like how it might uh, feel odd, odd, like odd at times, kind of like promoting oneself. Um, I do think that um, branding is basically like storytelling. And it's at times I joke that marketing is kind of getting you in your non-rationale in a way it's trying to appeal to like a more emotional thing. At, at times I do feel like journalism is that in itself too, where it's like, you're, you're trying to tell a story and there's some sort of like emotion or something that's being evoked. Um, so I do think that there are similarities um, that they have. Um, I, it, but I think the negative connotation of it, like when it comes to branding, it does it, it feels fabricated. And I think that's the thing where people are just like, yeah, well, you know, it's like, it's not really who you are, but with Snackshot, I kind of did build an extension of myself as a brand. So I do think that 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 there is ways of going about it and still like having that air of authenticity. I don't know if that's helpful, <laughs> the way that I'm like, like wording it, but that's kind of how I see it. Definitely. No, I think it is helpful. And I, as someone who has followed Snackshot, um, for a, a period of time, I could definitely feel that authenticity from you. And to speak to Snackshot, tell us like, what are some of the values in that brand? Yeah. Why did you build it? Yeah. So Snackshot started kind of as uh, during the pandemic, uh, if you ever want to expedite an existential crisis, I suggest you turn 30 <laughs> during a pandemic, but that kind of really was the, the, the moment where I felt like I really needed a more creative outlet. And I had been seeing uh, sort of like a trend in this like space that there was just a lot of stuff being put out there where there was no measure or balance to counteract it where it's like, I know I have the insight. I know that a lot of these things, these brands are promoting is kind of BS. 
And I have, you know, knowledge enough to know that eventually these things get called out. Um, this is why you see Kellogg's, you know, being sued for $30 million for promoting like healthy, health, quote unquote, healthy cereal that's like 30 grams of sugar, et cetera. So based on that inside, I kind of was, and I remember I probably had like a thousand followers on Twitter. And I'm like, I don't even know who's going to read this. I don't give a shit. Like, I was just going to like use Twitter as like my outlet to talk about the things that I felt that nobody was picking up or nobody was really talking about it and as someone who has worked with these brands before I do know that it kind of becomes very much of a circle jerk as in like well I'm not sure if I can say that but um it, it feels like it's more about you don't want to be ostracized so you keep quiet um and because I was really kind of like an outsider I don't really have a food brand um, I wasn't working in the CPD space. I'm coming from just like doing marketing and advertising. I just decided to just voice out and be like, wow, like, you know, why does water necessitate to have a vegan label now? Like, thank you so much for letting me know that I'm not like sipping on bone broth. Like, you know, <laughs> just kind of like calling out the ridiculousness that I was seeing and in a way that felt um, true to myself where it's like, I am very opinionated and I, you know, spoofing this industry and, and sort of like poking fun at it. And I remember doing these threads, I was like, oh, wow, look, they're trying to reinvent the tequila shot. And these are the brands that are doing it. And kind of just all the stuff that I've learned and all the stuff that I, I guess, like I, I know kind of like, oh, this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to position it this way, whatever. I kind of, these insights became kind of like what people were looking at me for. And I remember doing threads at first, even before I considered doing a newsletter and people like, oh, oh, can we have more of this? And they were just getting shared. And so I was just like, okay, cool. Let me explore what, what I would do with a newsletter. And this is one thing I tell people, like I was very intentional from the start because in, in 2020, Substacks were the equivalent of a sourdough starter. So I was like, you know, everybody's doing it. If I'm going to do it, then it has to have some intentionality behind it because I, as someone who studied communications, like I've always been very much interested in how we grew up as millennials. I'm a, I'm a 31 year old millennial, how we grew up with sort of the ex exposure to everything. So like um, being exposed to, you know, content, advertising, a, a, a lot of like mid eighties, uh, 90s millennials were literally born at a time where there was like deregulation of adverti children's advertising. So we were really being sold and exposed and sort of indoctrinated into overconsumption. So that's kind of like my guiding star. Like if I did something, I didn't want it to add to the noise. And if I did write about something that it had, uh, uh, I own the niche, like as in like, well, I'm going to start talking about these things that I feel like nobody was talking about. So kind of like as a journalist, I say like, maybe that you create your own beat. <laughs> I'm not a journalist, but like, I kind of did that where I was like, well, oh, nobody's talking about this. So I'm going to do it. And I'm also, because I'm outside of the US, I kind of had that perspective that I also hadn't seen where it's like, nobody's really talking about what's happening in CPD around the world. It's usually just like either the UK or the US, but there's really cool stuff happening in, in Mexico, same as in Australia, et cetera. So I kind of wanted to offer that like, well, this is very unique perspective that I haven't seen anywhere. Um, and I'm going to, I guess, just do it myself. So I remember the first issue I wanted to talk about what I was seeing in, in the rise of sober curious drinks and how I felt that the, why they were being so successful is how they were positioning themselves and marketing themselves, as opposed to how we, the, how you had seen it um, like in years prior, because it wasn't like a novel concept, but somehow it was starting to take off. So I kind of like unpacked that. I also wanted to have like a structure of like, okay, it's like following the thread. Um, it's, I'm unpacking a trend. I'm going to make it mainstream for people so that they can understand like why they're seeing adaptogen shit everywhere in their supermarkets now. So let me, let me go back and see where this is coming from. Um, what, what are the legacy brands doing about it? Where is their money being put towards? So in a, in a way, it's kind of like doing your own research and I guess like in a way reporting on like, here's, here's my, my finds. But like not just regurgitating information, I kind of wanted to tell people, okay, based on all my findings, here's what, here's what I theorize. And in the way to do it, that wasn't boring, that people are just going to be like, I'm not going to fucking read 3000 words on adaptogens because it has all this like really wor weird words and everybody's like, she's talking about like venture or whatever. Like I wanted it to be like every issue has its own story. So it's like an episode uh, like I, I try to describe it as if SNL, like 
if, if it's like an SNL skit meets the 90s, all that show and like on Nickelodeon meets Anthony Bourdain, um, like that's kind of all the, the vibe that I wanted to put into it, each issue. So for me, it was very much about, yes, I am doing, I'm telling this story, but the way that I'm doing it, I'm going to use a lot of parody and I'm going to use a lot of comedy because I do believe memes are uh, propagated reason because it's like it's like a way of understanding and conveying like a message that's like very easy to understand um even if it's like a complex idea so based on that I, I started to create sort of like my own parody universe uh where we had characters like the snack boy persona so this character came out of like well yes there is a lot of these brands being put out there and we're literally buying six dollar you know seltzers that promise you you know that have prebiotics, whatever, which is just like a cooler version than Metamucil because obviously millennials are at that pain, like that age where like we need more fiber in our diets. So that snack boy persona was something that I used to kind of convey the, the messages of what I was trying to convey where it's like, this person is the kind of person that spends, you know, too much time in the beverage aisle at Erewhon market, deciding between, you know, a nootropic and CBD or THC and adaptogens, you know, instead of going to like therapy or something. And so like the, the whole like spoof universe came out of that. And, and that was what it was initially. And then I remember I was like, okay, I have my three C's, which is curation, like content. And from like my voice growing, and, and literally I started with zero. I started with zero subscribers. I remember the first issue probably went out to 20 people. And then by the third month, I was getting emails from the head of Starbucks, like like the head of culinary at Starbucks, I mean, like that they're such a huge fan of Snapshot. So I think the the authenticity and, and, and I get I did get that sort of meme, meme factor where it just it propagated itself. Um, to the point that it went beyond my network. Cause I remember I was shocked. I was like, what the fuck? Like how is this person reading something? I I'm literally like outside of the U S like, I'm like some like person who has nothing to do with this industry. I don't have ties to anybody at these companies, but somehow it's gotten to them. So I will say like, I think that the stuff that I thought of initially is like, it has to have an intentionality. It has to have value obviously like what am I helping you like unpack or what am I helping you discover etc like it, that was like sort of like the guiding stuff that helped me eventually like turn it into you know over 21,000 subscribers we've only been it's only been a year and a half and it's literally read throughout you know the world literally um, I have stuff that gets picked up by like foreign press like my web three issue that got picked up by this major newspaper in Italy. And I was like, Oh my God, that's so funny. Or like, I'll see like people referring snapshot, um, like in Japanese media, et cetera. It's like, it's wild. It's, it really did grow like wildfire. But I do think that inherently it was mostly because I focused first on like that, I, that it has that sort of unique POV that it has, it is giving value to people. Um, and it is doing in a way that's different, that's interesting, that's not, again, just regurgitating information that people want to share. And that I remember that was going to be my, my, my number one, that I knew that it, has, it was giving something that it made people share it organically. And I, from the first start, I said, I'm not going to do any referral tactics because I don't want to gamify a following. I would rather have 500 subscribers that read and have like my 50% open rate than have 100,000 subscribers that, you know, it's not really because they want to be there or because they want to read the content. Because to me, it was a lot more valuable to have people to know that people are just are here because they want to and that they look forward to it and that they're actually like opening it and engaging with the content. So I did it, I went away from doing referral tactics. And then another thing that I wanted to, to explore was how does it look like to create something um, that's a media that doesn't necessitate um, sponsorship or advertising? Because I knew that if I had this opinion and, and I'm very opinionated and I do, you know, I curse a lot in my, in my newsletters, I poke fun of stuff, I parody, and so like, I knew that if I started to, to work with like sponsors and stuff, that that's, that was going to change. That dynamic was going to change because I had to, you know, focus on the sponsors, whatever, and their voice and what was appropriate, you know, to do for them or not. And so I opted out of that um, as a way of, of monetizing, because I also thought like, what, it, what does it look like to create a media that is supported by the community, mm. you know? 
that you know people are starting newsletters and, and paywalling it that's support from their readers or community or whatever um i obviously don't couldn't do that because i didn't have access to stripe because for those who don't know if you don't live in the us it's not really readily available and most of these um platforms whether it's stripe or ghost or all these like popular writing platforms are all tied to stripe so I opted to do a Patreon and it was it was very interesting too because that whole dynamic also allowed me to explore what does it look like when you're not telling people how this is valuable, like how much of you see this is worth. What how what does it look like when people you allow for people to to tell you what it's worth to them? So I remember I initially started a Patreon with three three tiers. It was like five, ten, and twenty-five, and you had the option to do whatever you wanted. And then it was wild to me that people started like subscribing to be a hundred dollar patrons, like way beyond, like way more than I had expected. And I have people now currently paying me $250 a month for a free newsletter. And so I do think that uh, I, I, it was really great kind of like in a way a, a blessing to be able to see like, oh shit, like, you know, like I thought no one's going to pay more than 25, but that to be able to see like, oh, that's how much value these people are putting that towards towards my work but wow. yeah okay Andrea <laughs> that was amazing I, re I feel like there's so much to dig into um so we're going to backtrack a little bit but I love like just like that broad overview of your journey up to that point of launching the Patreon especially and I know this might bother a few of us so you mentioned three C's was it content curation oh I'm sorry yeah and so consulting I'm so sorry and what was the third yeah, kind of consulting consulting, consulting. Got yeah, it, I'm so it. sorry. I kind of like, like my, that's how my brain operates. Um, no, but if I you've ever it. read any of my content, then you know that that's literally how I write. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is fantastic. And so, okay. So yeah, when you were like starting to create this parody universe, which I thought was fascinating, we're just going to get into the nitty gritty. So you start to just get some user, I don't know, interest through just Twitter threads, like tweet threads, yeah. it's like, and you kind of follow that and explore that before you actually put out the first newsletter, did you already construct this parody universe? Like how much of this snack boy, snack pals uh, concept was already in your mind and you're going to implement? Yeah, for sure. The snack boy persona, but I didn't really start to talk about it because I, I honestly, I was thinking like, I don't think people are going to get it. Um, but it was already in my mind. Um, but yeah, like it, it kind of evolved. Um, and I, I actually wanted to say like how it actually evolved into the, the from there it went into the bigger parody of like, oh, I started a cult, but you know, we can we can get to there. Um, I don't know if there was anything else. That you yeah, yeah, say. yeah. And yeah. so, okay. So th that first few newsletters, you're kind of just like slowly growing. Um, how did your like voice and format like really evolve? And did you tap into other, did you talk to other people, advisors or mentors prior to launching the newsletter or just going down this journey? So, yeah, I think Emmett Shine, who does Gin Lane um, Pattern Brands, he's someone that I was really, uh, someone that I had been admiring from afar. Obviously he lives in New York and I lived in Honduras, but I had been keeping up because obviously I worked I worked in marketing and so like gin lane was literally the like the coolest hottest agency that had done the branding for things like sweet green and hams and her so we're talking about like now worth billions dollar companies so it's someone that i really admired um from the start but when i first started it because it, i was like i was literally like an outsider like it's when i first started again i had like 20 like um subscribers so i was like am i talking to the void <laughs> Um, and I was, and so I remember I, I hit him up and we, he kind of gave me some advice as to like, cause I was like, you know, I'm literally at odds here. Cause I'm like this unknown person from like this country that at times I have to tell people like, oh no, we're not part of South America. There's a thing between South America and North America. That's where I live, Central America. And so he was just, his, his advice to me was the best thing. Like he was like, look, if, if this doesn't pan out, whatever, like just devote entire, like your, devote yourself to this. And if this doesn't pan out, just know that, you know, you have someone in your corner and that's, you know, we can explore, you know, whether to pivot or whatever. Cause in this moment I was like, we were talking about, I was in seven months. I was already like in a seven month lockdown when I started Snackshot. 
and in our country was kind of like it was really bad and I was trying to explore also this as an idea of like oh can this be something that can help me find ways to get out of Honduras you know if I needed to and so it was kind of like a very emotional <laughs> journey for me because it was like I you know if I could do this because other people are doing it and they're making money from writing just whatever they want and exploring their passions so like I wanted to explore that too but I think in that moment the biggest advice was like just if you're going to do it then dedicate yourself to it and that's what I did and when I tell people I don't joke like I spent 175% of my effort like to do this because I wanted to do it really well so I spent obviously hours doing research learned photoshop I taught myself photoshop because I was like I don't obviously don't have uh, like a designer budget, whatever. But I, I knew that I wanted to have this be very visual. Um, I wanted to have collages and I wanted to, and I didn't even know how to like remove the fucking background. Um, Cause I was always kind of like um, doing strategy or like the copywriting. I wasn't the, here's a technical design thing kind of to do. So I, I learned Photoshop and I started doing my own images. And it was so funny because that also helped shape the voice of it. it. It went along with it. It was so campy and so bad. And you, can, you guys can literally go to our first, like the first issue. And it was so bad. I was like, I'm just going to own it and be like, who cares? Like that, that is what it is. But that's the only help kind of that I got where it was just like, just do it. But if you're going to do it, you might as well focus everything you have and, and give it to you. And from that moment that I had that conversation, that was like when I was crafting like my second issue. Um, we're talking about like the first issue came out last, like the last week of August. And we're talking about like mid September. And I remember that's when I my it was like a like a switch. And I and I just started devoting all of my energy towards it and like doing my research putting together the the stories behind it um doing like uh like the visuals and the curation aspect of it like okay what are the brands cool brands that are doing it in this space whatever and that's when it just started to take a life on its own and that's when i started to get all these like the heads of innovation and r d at nestle and people you know at, at starbucks and them even hitting me up like by February, like Starbucks literally hit me up and was like, we can, can we, and that's when like the consulting aspect of it started. It was like literally them asking me how much I charge for an hour of my time so I could roast their menu. They're like, can you like make fun of us? Because like, that's kind of like the, the, <laughs> the vibe that people are getting where she's like, she's really good at parodying and like, like in a way speaking truth to that. And it was great. It was amazing. It was probably like one of the best things that I've ever done. It was like, I can't believe. And I remember even trying to come up with like an hourly rate. I was like asking other women um, that I had met on Twitter and like asking them like, how do you, how much do you charge? And, and then we had a lot of conversation about a lot of women, how they feel like they're underpaid because men charge more or whatever. And it was like, this, like, I had no idea that even was like a thing like that. The, but anyways, it's a, another conversation for another day. But that's even how I got into doing the consulting aspect of it. I was like, oh, my God, like I've never been a freelancer before. I've never I've always worked with like an agency and doing work mm -hmm. with an agency. So like it was like, oh, I got to set my own prices and, and, and exploring that and and learning from that. But but yeah, I feel like uh, I feel like I was I, I do attribute Emmett um, as being sort of like that person that like in, in that moment. I felt very much constricted and it was kind of liberating to have someone say, dude, I think you're talented. I got your back regardless, whether mm -hmm. this idea pans out. So I think that that was really kind of like pivotal for me. And talk about your outsider perspective. So it's super clear that you being in a Honduras has just like authentically shaped who you are, but also the brand and also how you picked like certain platforms to you know, actually yeah. work with um, based on for better, for worse. So maybe tell us yeah. a little bit about, yeah, what were some of the trade-offs you had to think through or make in the yeah. early days? Yeah, well, a hundred percent. I mean, even till now, I don't have access to Stripe, but I'm now that God making enough of, of revenue from Snapshot that I can, I started the process of incorporating in the U.S. to get access to Stripe. So 
that was kind of a pivotal a year and a half in the making kind of very proud moment for me because <laughs> it's not really easy um but yeah um working with paypal working with patreon that take insane amount of fees from you i will say like that really sucks um but you know it's the the other option is to not explore the idea of monetizing so i was like well i'll work with what i have and that's kind of what i had even working with like like giving people my like working like consulting stuff like they're like oh can we use bill.com and i'm like no oh can we send like a wire transfer or whatever and like no because like my bank doesn't work the same way that it works like and it was i remember like the first uh, time that i did try to do like a wire transfer for this company that i worked with uh, that i wrote something for them in the uk and they were like oh you this is what we use whatever and i spent so much of my time um going back and forth with my bank and getting information and then they're like no this is not what we need whatever that i was just like i lost that and i was like you know you either work with me knowing that i can only use paypal to invoice you and get money through that because that's the most convenient thing to me because i'm not going to spend or i don't I, this is not worth my time anymore like getting this money in our number i was just like i can't spend hours like having this conversation so like now even i learned about that like that and now i don't let i don't work with people unless they know like explicitly like this is my way of like com getting compensation and you have to work with me cuz like you don't know what it's the hardship of like having to go through all these like fire hoops being outside of the the privilege of having an access to a stripe account whatever or like to have you know the ease access of banks that work with easily work with wire transfers whatever so I don't know it was like a learning experience like i had to do my own research and had to like kind of see like well what is it available to me and i'm the kind of person who has to do i can't like linger too much on an idea so i just did it i spun it up and and it's there and it, the biggest like my biggest like yes i know i'm doing something right is when people like shift their payment option to upgrade so like when people go from like 10 to 25 or when people go to from 5 to 25 that's like man this is you you were we're doing something right so i feel like it, my advice is also to take cues from that too where it's like with you know to keep that kind of tells you a lot too of of you know whether it's what people perceive as quality or if you like you know have you lost your way <laughs> whatever but um that again like using patreon allowed me to have that tiered system in a way that that ha helped me learn a lot of like gave me feedback in itself just seeing how people were interacting with with what i was with the options that i had out there that's right and so how long had you been writing the newsletter before you implemented the patreon three months because I was so scared. I was like, people aren't going to want to pay for this. <laughs> I was like, but, but people were telling me like, no, you should, you should, you should pay wallet. And because I couldn't pay wallet, I was just like, okay, I'll put a link to like, oh, and I, and I say, like, this is, this is ad free. Like, if you think that, you know, this is valuable, here's where you can like support snapshot. Mm -hmm. And then I started to get, to get my first one and then my second one. And then it was just like, holy shit. Like, and to see like people paying like the the most popular one was the most the highest amount which was twenty five dollars, and then came the like whoa what you're gonna pay me a hundred dollars for a free newsletter, but you know that and and that's so that was like when I had my first ease and then the the fourth one came also like like a couple of months in and the community aspect of it started to shape itself. And that was crazy because I'm like, holy shit, I was talking to the void. And then one day the void is talking back to me. And the, the, like, uh, the day I realized I had started to started something was when I was getting like inboxes on Twitter, on Instagram. And I didn't even start our Instagram until January. So like, it was like, I started this late August and I started the Instagram like in January because people were like trying to send me pictures of like their fridges. Like I remember there was like this Australian person who sent me a picture of a fridge in Australia, or, like a hotel in Australia. He's like, oh my God, these beverages are so snack shot. I'm like, what the fuck? That's so funny. And so because people are like trying to um talk to me and and wanting more, I was like, um, I guess I may have started like a cult. Like people are self-proclaiming themselves as snack boys, which I don't even think they know. It's literally a parody. <laughs> but people oh, are like, yeah, kid. I'm a proud snack boy, whatever. 
So then I started like, kind of like, oh shit, I guess we started a cult. And that's when the whole cult leader kind of thing. I mean, when you get people like now that I'm doing IRL events, like the fact that I can get people to literally engage in a snack seance with me and chant like absurd shit and wear masks and literally worship, like try to resurrect like 2000s purple Heinz ketchup. Like the, the fact that I had people lining up to burn incense to a fake purple ketchup, like I knew I was like, shit, this is, yeah. When you get people to do weird stuff, <laughs> like it just, but yeah, that's when, that's when the whole, like the cult kind of thing, when, when, the, when I started to see that there were people wanting to, to, to interact more with me. And then I eventually evolved that into a discord because I felt like, okay, I want these people to meet each other <laughs> and like connect with each other because <laughs> I'm just one person. Right. And, and that's, that's what it, what it started. But I also, again, I didn't want it to be gamified. I didn't want to tell people like join our discord and win like discount, whatever. I'm like, if you're, if you're wanting to explore more and I have that in my issues where it's like, do you want to take this relationship further? Like join our discord and people join people tell me like I have never used this before I'm literally downloading it like now yeah. to use it but that you know it's it's also grown slowly um and I like that because I feel like it's manageable and I feel like it's now I remember when I thought it was like 300 was a lot and now it's like over like it's like a thousand five hundred plus people there and it's like now we have we have even, even like tiered cities we have like London um LA San Francisco like you know that people are that, that's one of the, the also like indicators of like, oh, I know where I have to go next to nurture the community. Mm -hmm. So this literally evolved from like an online newsletter <laughs> to now like, like partnerships and events and community meetups and, um, you know, now evolving to hopefully be able to be its own platform. Um, because got to own your platforms. That's one thing I will say. <laughs> if you're going to, you know, you need to understand that there's limitations from the platforms. So if you can evolve this into turning it into your own platform, that's kind of one thing that I learned. Because like, you know, Substack has not, even though I've talked to people at Substack, they have never even considered experiencing, like do, experimenting with another payment option, you know, mm -hmm. to be more inclusive. So like, I just know like, uh, I would also say like, you have to know that eventually in, if you're still on these platforms that they, they have the, the advantage point versus you trying to develop your own platform. But I've been very kind of like steadily building up to this. Um, but yeah, so the fourth, now I have a fourth C, which was the community <laughs> that came oh, out. Yeah. Of the, the, the yeah. All the C's make a lot of sense. And when you launched the Discord, did you, was there a decision at least being like, oh, should I do a Slack or Circle? I mean, there's so many community apps now. I mean, why'd you get yeah. Discord? Especially if you knew not a lot of people were on it. Yeah, I feel like I chose Discord because I, I saw that like it was like very easy to thread stuff. So I create different channels for it. Um, and also like, slack is triggering for people because it's mostly tied to work <laughs> so mm. i was like yeah. you know um i'm gonna do discord just because i've also had also been ex experimenting being part of a discord community and i just found it easy enough for me to learn to use it so that i could like okay i set up a bot imagine like i had to even teach myself how to set up a freaking bot <laughs> and i set it up it's called the snack bot um and I was like this this, this spot is gonna greet people and, and I made like rules around like community rules like we have to be respectful with each other et cetera, et cetera. and then setting the tone um for how I want this like community to kind of operate and, and I even made my do my fake doctrines for our, our cult um that is like you know if you're here you believe in the same beliefs that Snapchat does which is that excess is access is death curation is salvation and discovery is strength because that that's kind of like what we do we help you discover new brands curate and we also like i'm very anti um access so like when people tell me like oh when are you going to be a directory when are you going to be a, a marketplace whatever i always tell people like i know you've never read snack shop because you know that that's kind of like the antithesis of the um Mm -hmm. And also like building on, like we have fake, we, feel, we have fake nemesis, like the snack first has evolved into like fake nemesis, which is chocolate mint and espresso martinis. And so like, those like, there's running gags where it's like, you know, that that's like kind of like the nemesis of snack shot. And then there's also like the running gag that uh, we have like a fake television network. It's called Oracular Spectacular. And it's a segment in 
snapshot that's been going on for a while now. And it's always, it's always starts the same way. It's like, shh, my favorite show is about to start. And the show is called What's New You Ask. And it's literally where I present people like curated, like the new, the new brands that they should be looking out for or whatever. But it really is like, it's, it's something that I just play along with where it's like, I just keep on creating different stuff. And, and in a way, what I would say Snapchat has become is sort of a curated, a gamified curation that in turn equals insights. So, yeah. <laughs> Why do you think this universe has like drawn so many followers? Like, I think that's such a, such a fascinating uh, step you've taken. And I want to know like how intentional it was. It sounds like it is, but it also feels like you're kind of dancing with your community too. Like they're kind of showing you where to go and you're yeah. kind of following yeah, yeah. a little bit. <laughs> So yeah, tell us like why, what's your theory as to like, why now, why are people looking to worship purple ketchup Heinz or Heinz ketchup? <laughs> oh, and oh, oh. What's the, what's the zeitgeist you're tapping into? So I, okay. I've written about this and if you guys want to check it out, I've written in depth about it. There's an issue called horny, horny people. And then there's another one called American snack boy, which I wrote all on like what my iteration of, of Patrick Bateman would be <laughs> if he mm. was a snack boy. But I talk about that a lot. I talk about how I feel like our generation in particular, we're the snacks generation. And that, that I say like, ha, huh, we used to, they used to tell us like, don't snack because you know, you're ruining your meal and like jokes on you because now snacks are the entire meal. And it really is like the data like shows you that where it's like our generation, Gen Z, we're le- eating less like meal tables at meals like the three you know the three standard that we grew up with which is like the breakfast and the table and like whatever people are snacking a lot more also we're all like as we became like the biggest uh consumer demographic we are shifting from legacy brands so i have written about this how i feel like our generation is seeing food and beverage as signalers as external signalers in the same way that you know fashion items are viewed so that's why you have like Erewhon becoming this like go-to spot to like you know like get your groceries whatever you have uh which I joke that there are deities and I always joke that you have to give tribute to them <laughs> because they're so expensive um but yeah like Foxtrot is another one and, and 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 it's literally shaping like how how we're uh how we're doing groceries you know, the rise of the curated grocers like pop-up grocer too where it's like experiential like the fact that we have like our generation literally like has grocery stores with mirrors now that you can take selfies because like that's that's us and so I do think I did I I mean I did pick up on it that's why I created the snack boy persona where it's like you and like you can even see too like Pinterest said last year that the biggest uh place getting the makeover is the kitchen and the particular place is the pantries so like now you have all these like open shelf pantries I really want to take a picture of their shelfie you know shelfies are the new selfies like you know it used to not be that you were letting people know that you're buying you know organic organic you know fermented ketchup like nobody gave a shit about like the cereal that you were eating you know but now it's like it's all about signaling you it's crazy. Like it's not even just with like, um, just like emerging brands, like go to like Lunchables, like Instagram and go to their tag photos. It's crazy how much, like they've captured like three generations, both like millennials, Gen Z and like Gen Alpha, which is the one that comes after. And these kids are literally there. I found a, a niche that it's all videos of like Lana Del Rey and like all these hipster mania, popular songs that these Gen Alpha kids, they're like tweens. They're like, posting pictures on Instagram of them opening Lunchables and preparing pizza Lunchables to the tune of that. I'm like, it's crazy. Like no one gives a shit about snacks as much as we do now. So I feel like, I think that this is what resonates with people because one, they say they want to, a snack boy wants to signal in the middle. Like I made like a silly tune that was like snack boys cop all the Olipop drops because Olipop is this like trendy prebiotic seltzer that has all these different like launches and flavors whatever so in the same way that a sneakerhead is waiting for the next thing that nike or adidas drops whatever that's the same thing that a snack boy is doing but it's just literally like snacks like the trendiest drink or whatever because it I, it signals to people like i'm in the know i know what's up and coming i know what's trendy whatever like the fact that people are doing grocery hauls like that's hilarious like have you seen them like literally people like put like 
their grocery house, like they put it out there, like on their on their kitchen counter or whatever, and they they Instagram it, and they're like, oh, today's grocery haul, whatever. Like it's literally like its own niche in itself. But I've kind of taken the approach of like let's parody this whole movement <laughs> instead right. of taking it seriously. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, I'm a big fan of being able to integrate like the humor and also extrapolate the truth. Um, by using some of these ideas to kind of reveal what's actually going on. And so I Mm -hmm. think you do that very elegantly, but I'm so surprised. I'm looking at the time. It's actually like two more minutes. I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to open it up to audience Q&A. And for everyone who's listening, feel free to either ask your question in the chat. Um, I will defer to Jeremy because I think he's seen some of the questions come through over the course of the conversation. And you can either ask the question by unmuting yourself directly, or I can ask it for you. So last question, if you could give you know, like three pieces of branding advice for like people in this room, but also people who are just starting out and trying to figure out, you know, what's their voice, what platform to go on, like, what would it be? Mm-hmm. I would say when, in terms of what platform, just get it, whatever is easiest to you, get it started. I feel like that's the biggest like pain point you have to go through. It's just like, I did it. I launched a uh, Substack. So I would say that what's easiest and most convenient to you, I, to me, I, I went to Substack because it was easy for me to use and for me to put these things together. And I feel like that's, that's, that's something that helps out. Um, I think being authentic and honing like you in the way that you would own your beat, then your own kind of like your voice and your POV. I always tell people like, don't gaslight people out of their own experiences, especially when it comes to food and beverage. I like to tell people like, it's okay to have like different opinion. That's the whole like premise of Snackshot where it's like, yo, I'm not buying that. You're giving me a meditation in a can. Like, you know, I'm going to be upset if I'm going to be like buying the $6 adaptogenic seltzer and I'm not getting tongued by the Dalai Lama, you know, like it's just, that's just BS. And so um, it's, it's true. Like, so I feel like, people can have you know their own POV and they should be able to own it um you know and and be and have fun with it if you're not having fun then I would say like (laughs) I would I would highly encourage that this is something that you also enjoy doing and have fun doing I think Mm -hmm. those would be my three ultimate tips perfect no thank you so much and awesome anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question otherwise um Jeremy, was there a question that was asked that we should? Um, somebody wanted to somebody wanted to drill in a little bit more on the consulting um, because for a lot of people that's a new thing and and they're curious about how you ended up um, with a rate that seemed right for you and um, maybe you can just share other thoughts about how people can get involved in doing that yeah. if they'd like to do more. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. So from the conversations that I had with people that I reached out to, because I know they had done been doing consulting, they said, start with a rate that feels comfortable. One, if people get that, like if people accept your rate too easily, then you know that you're sort of underselling yourself. And then two, every time someone agrees to your rate, they, the advice I was given was that add 20% to the next one. And that's how you grow. So those are two two things that have helped me <laughs> get to a point where I feel comfortable um, and also like work with people. Like I know that, you know, Conagra brands or Nestle or these brands, the, these brands have a lot more budget to work with. And so I don't feel as bad, like telling them this is how much I charge versus when other people that are just starting off, I will tell them like, Hey, maybe you can't pay for like, like uh, this whole proposal, but you know, I can quote you for like, two hours of my time and is that something that your budget so I also also like try to tell people like you should try to work with people in the beginning too to see like how you can accommodate them without also like underselling yourself but yeah those are sort of like the tips that I've learned (laughs) as I've gone and developed this yeah yeah um how do you handle how do you handle conflict of interest questions or issues that arise if you're kind of writing about all these different brands and then potentially consulting or advising them? Oh, way? they don't care. That's what I'm telling you. Like I should, like I should post like all these brands and they come to me and they say like, how can we work together? I feel like they kind of, in a way, like, I don't know, maybe they respect that I'm not sort of like someone that they can buy their way into or whatever. And I don't really think that that's actually, it was so funny, by the way, I, I, this is a good example. Like 
I once joked, like, because I used to have an anonymous uh, hotline where people would tell me stuff, like, you know, people were upset that double stuffed Oreos were coming out single stuffed. So in one of my issues, I made a joke that, oh, yeah, you know, Oreo has a bunker now, you know, like, there's, there's definitely they're they're putting the money somewhere else. And I made up this conspiracy theory that they were like tied to the Knights Templar. And, you know, I said, look at their logo. It's so similar, whatever. Months later, I kid you not, I got an email from the CMO of Mondelez, which owns Oreo. And they're like, hi, I think I would love to talk to you. I was so scared. I was like, holy shit, dude, they're going to sue me or something. And then we got on the phone and they were like laughing. They're like, this is so funny. Like, what are you talking about us? Like some conspiracy theory. And it was, it was so funny. They laughed it off. They're like, that's so funny. And I'm like, you just have to be honest. I'm pretty sure there are there, there is some sort of validity to claims that, you know, your, your double stuff are coming less stuffed and we just joked about it, but, you know, I really haven't experienced in anything to them, to this moment. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Kayla, also, not that I recommend, not that I recommend going for uh, like torching, yeah. <laughs> don't take my advice. <laughs> um, yeah. Kayla, do you want to ask your question or shall we? Kayla Polanco. Awesome. Okay, great. Uh, what are some trends you see Latinas doing on the web? Andrea. Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not really like, like, um, I, I, I mean, I, I hope that this encourages a trend of, of more Latinas to be like, seeing that this either can be, you know, to start off as a way to do additional income or to be do more into consulting. I would, I want to see more Latinas being in, into consulting and, and to be able to like, also, um, like be in panels. And I've, I've obviously like, honestly, like, I feel very surprised, like that this actually led me to even have appearances, TV appearances, like I had never been on TV. And I remember Access Hollywood would reach out and I was like, do you know I'm not from the US? And they're like, yeah, we don't care. We just want you to come on the show and talk about food trends. <laughs> so I was like, so I don't know if there's, I don't know if I could tell you. I hope that this encourages, you know, I have seen more Latino influencer creators like on TikTok and stuff, which I love, but I do hope that it also encourages people to explore like, hey, maybe I don't have to be in the camera all the time. Um, and I can leverage, you know, my writing or, or my expertise to get on speaking panels. And, and you know, I, I write uh, too for like other publications like Courier in the UK, like that's really cool. It's like shit, then it says like I'm from Honduras and that makes me feel like, hell yeah, like I'm putting like good rep um, behind my, my country that at times doesn't have the best rep. Um, and so I'm showing people there's a different light to whatever you have heard about my country. like. Um, and it also, like, I also like to tell people, like, if you think of me so like kindly and you think of me as someone, wow, how ad admirable you went from like nothing to like, from like having no audience to like, you know, getting the New Yorker to, to ask you to do a, a parody like thing that I did for them. And I was like, oh my, I, if you would have told me, I would have been like, shut the fuck up. Like I could have never imagined, like I would have a byline in the New Yorker. I, someone who studied communication, like I fucking love that publication. It was like a, literally a dream come true. So I feel like I would like to tell people like in terms of like, as someone who potentially might immigrate, like if you think of me in a way that you find admirable, just know that there's not, I'm not a unique person. There's so many people that also like me that kind of have, you know, same limitations if not even more than I have. Um, and that, you know, that you see immigrants and you see people from other countries in a, in a, in a, in a way that's like more, more of like kindly the same that you offer to me. So I also try to like tell people too, like, I also, you know, I try to voice the, the limitations and at times the inaccessibility and, you know, even doing Stripe Atlas just to get the Stripe account. Like I wouldn't be able to do it if I didn't have like some income coming in from, all these different things because it in involves like legal fees etc that not a lot of people have the privilege to to be able to do so i try to use this platform to also try to bring light to that and shed light to like that some some stuff is still not really widely accessible no matter how much they try to tell you that creator economy is changing the world you know there's still a lot to improve definitely um lori do you want to ask your question Awesome. I will ask it for you. Uh, who do you consider your competition? 
who do I consider my competition? Ah, people tell me this all the time, but honestly, like, I don't see any competition because I feel like I literally created this. And I even have an article that says like, the, the job you probably didn't know existed. And it was like, yeah, because I fucking created it. Um, so there are people that I have seen that kind of want to do the same, like curation type of thing. Um, but I like, no, I don't want to sound cocky. I just like, it just feels like my stuff is very niche. <laughs> it's like, I don't think anybody else is here telling people like, oh, call yourself a snack boy and like do this cult thing, whatever. Like, so I don't know. I feel like you're competing. You're always competing for people's attention. I feel like anything that can grab your attention is a competition inherently. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's oh, kind of how I see it. Relatedly, I would love to know. Yeah. So you started doing some more in-person events. Um, what are some of your goals for like 2022? Like, where do you see this all going? Yeah. 2022, hopefully we'll have the snack first platform, at least the first version of it, where it's going to be a home for, uh, our community but also for brands and I I've seen myself as an intermediary in this space as in like I try to work with brands to be like hey can you be more balanced in your approach like stop telling people you're literally like you know this salvation or whatever when just be real like just I do believe we're at a point where people are going to call out the bullshit more than you think like because you know this other generation that comes after millennials like, it's even more outspoken like go see, you know, what, what these kids are talking about on TikTok. It's crazy. So I feel like on, on the other hand, I also want to be able to continue to be the bridge and gap in the education of people like, here's why you're, here's why you're upset that the CBD drink isn't doing anything. It's because this amount dissolved, like dissolved in like a water or a seltzer isn't really going to do much for you. And we, we probably didn't know that. Um, and I, I joke that at times I feel like the Dr. Phil of this industry, because I'm here holding both hands and I'm just like, Hey guys, like, I think that we can all live in a more positive environment and take all the qualities that I've been able to like get from snapshot that people love so much, the discovery, the, the educational aspect, but also like the, the, the freedom of like owning your own taste and not letting people be gas, like let you be gaslighted because you're into this brand and the other person didn't like it, whatever. So like taking all those qualities and building out the actual, like what does snack first look like as a platform and also as a way to scaling myself as in like, I'm, it's not only just tied to me anymore. And that's one of the reasons why I've been doing the, the IRL events. Cause I want to get to nurture the community, want to get, be able to give them back. Um, also solve the friction points that I that I see, you know, that they that they have or that that brands have, and how do I do that in a way where it's like it's not me, it that's me twenty four seven. That's something that I don't have to be online. You don't have to be talking to me. That all of these things are going to be done through this platform. Like that's that's like inherently my goal. And obviously, I hope to be able to uh, nurture the international community. I hope to be able to do. I'm, I'm planning to do an event um, in London if if it's you know something that i can do and you know we're we're not going to go through another outbreak or whatever but you know there's a lot of of snapshot people in the uk who have been asking me to have an event etc and for now i've done just new york la san francisco and austin was our fourth city and it, the turnout has been amazing and people get to to you know com like have camaraderie around building a snack brand and just like what we love doing which is discovering other brands whatever and um you know giving those people the, that connection to like being that tie that brings all these people together like i literally had a founder call me and say like dude that austin event that you did was so great like we we started this like a weekly dinner club <laughs> from it and so like those things like to me it's just like how do i contribute to this uh industry in a way that's 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 helping both and, and becoming that leveling playing field, that equalizer. This is why I don't do PR pitches. If I'm, if I'm curating and I have that trust of my, my audience, et cetera, like how do I leverage that to help Mexican brands get into the US market? I've done that. Like there's a brand that I curated that got uh, picked up by Foxshot because they literally said like, we saw you on Snapshot. And now this one person team brand in Guadalajara, Mexico, has items in all of the Foxtrot uh, shelves, which is like a, a bunch of them. And to be able to say like, hey, you know, I helped make that happen. And I helped put a small brand into like other people's eyes that can can help them grow, whatever. Like 
that's kind of what I keep, want to keep on doing. And, and, and that's where I kind of want to keep developing this, which is less about me. And it's more about like, how does this help? How does this contribute back? And sort of like a ongoing, like a living organism in itself. So that's hope, hopefully what I'm, plan, what I'm hoping to be able to do by the end of the year, have our uh, own platform. No small feat. Can you tell us just what is your, a day like in your life? Like how much are you working? Realistically? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm on a lot of calls. I try to keep my mornings to myself. Um, and then I do calls like around noon in the, in the afternoon. And then the nights is where I write and where I do my, my creative <laughs> endeavors, but it really is just, it's, it's me most, most of the time. I don't even do like a uh, phone, like uh, video calls. I'm literally on the phone while I'm putting together an issue or, you know, I'm, you know, doing a drop like I did yesterday with unibrands.com. That's like a, a fun spoof on like a uh, batter meets, meets snacks. And so like, uh, I mean, I'm never off. And I'm not sure that's something that should be celebrated, but it's just like, I have no, no, hopefully I'll be able to manifest a team soon enough, but it really is. It really is like, it's, it's, it's not stop. Like, and I also work with brands like in Australia and the UK. So like I'm at times, like I've been working with someone in, in Thailand and I literally have to take calls like at 8 PM because that's the only way the 13 hour difference like works with me. So like, it just, it really is 24 seven kind of thing <laughs> not wow. really 24 seven but like very much like I really don't don't have a chance like I literally have a call like in two one minute <laughs> so and gonna... with that thank you so much uh for coming we're gonna let you go this has been a really yeah. awesome conversation and yeah I can't thank you enough Andrea for sharing some of your experiences with us so yeah, really well, thank you so it. much and yeah. please feel free to hit me up D DM me on Twitter. Uh, you know, I'm always happy to chat to. I'm insane. I take people's calls. Like, I just love to get to meet people. And if there's anything I can do um, to help, um, let me know. But thank you so much for having me. And you guys have a great day. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye, Andrea. Bye. So, we're going to segue now to a breakout sessions for anyone who wants to join. It's just an opportunity for us to kind of get to know another. And I believe Charlotte and Jeremy is going to be breaking us out into groups. And it's just a 10 to 15 minutes. Introduce yourself, talk about the projects that you're working on, the challenges that you're working on. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Yvonne. Yep, off we are to breakout rooms. I mean, you'll see a breakout room to join. Um, there's just a couple of rooms. Um, and see you there. <laughs>